John Abley, and I'm a retired founder chairman of Boston Scientific. Well, first of all, there's going to be a, a sort of a, a, a resistance to new technology, I submit, partly because uh, the people who pay for healthcare today are very concerned that technology has been the biggest contributor to costs. And uh, I personally believe that that actually is not the case. Uh, technology can be expensive or it actually can save money. And you've got to understand the difference and know how to use it and know where the big costs are and then go after reducing those costs. And then if you're going to do a technological innovation, you've got to do it in such a way that uh, it allows patients to monitor and understand their own health better and to be partners in their own health improvement. And for some strange reason, the healthcare profession has not done that. They tend to think that healthcare is too complicated uh, for them to understand. And there are lots of efforts now, all around the edges anyway, to try to change that model. And I think as a result of that, ultimately, uh, health care will uh, become less expensive. In fact, it'll be uh, focused on wellness rather than, in other words, prevention. Uh, and we're already seeing some of that. But to figure out uh, those technologies that will enhance that. And that is going to come from a number of areas, in, in, in my view. Uh, one of which will be imaging. I imaging has been around now for a while. It's had an amazing impact uh, on, in my career. Not that we did much in developing imaging technology, although we did do some. It had an impact because it allowed us to use tools that until you could see inside people better, you couldn't use. So that's been, been a big one. Uh, other technologies that are going to be game changers. I think we can see a lot of them in things like uh, uh, the molecular uh, manipulation, if you will. Uh, molecular intervention is another way to, to call that, where you literally design molecules that are uh, aimed at a patient specifically. So it's called personalized medicine. And by understanding not just the DNA of that patient, but how that patient, uh, uh, how they behave chemically, how they behave metabolically. Uh, if you know that in advance, you can give them exactly the right drug with fewer side effects, less costly, smaller amounts, and get amazing benefits. That, that knowledge side is one of the big uh, sort of railroad trains that is going to change the way medicine is practiced. Well, there are certainly a number of people, uh, Aubrey de Grey and, and, and uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who, who believe that you can live forever, so to speak. Uh, but I, I, um, I think this is a wonderful question to put into the philosophical department. It's not what you can do that counts. It's what should you do that counts. If you have too many people, you're going to have another type of disease on this earth. And we already have that. And if we reach the 9 billion population level by 2050, which is the number that a lot of people are throwing uh, around, um, I think we're going to see even more complications. Um, frankly, I don't think we will see that. I think there are another thing, a number of things going on uh, in terms of the earth uh, that will limit that that population. It's almost Darwinian in, uh, in nature. I'm not sure if there has to be an ideal way. I think I'm a big believer in learning through failure, trying things out, because you get this wonderful serendipitous learning things that you didn't intend to learn phenomenon when you, when you experiment, when you try things out. I'm a big fan of IDEO. Uh, and, and uh, Tim Brown and, and the Kelly brothers and, and so forth, uh, their concept uh, is that it's important to understand 
what people do and why they do it, not by putting them in a focus group, but by watching them and listening to them. Watch how they behave. And you will pretty quickly uh, understand the needs that they have that sometimes a result from misunderstandings. So this allows you to, un to see great opportunities that a lot of people won't see if they don't go, th uh, go through that process. Uh, in, in the case of IDEO, they call it design thinking. Uh, other people, I call it sort of whole systems thinking, where what you want to do is look at, again, the big picture and understand how behavior here affects behavior around it. And if you're thinking about uh, developing ideas or methodologies or services or products that are going to be truly sustainable, then you have to understand sustainability in all the areas, not just economic uh, or, or environmental, but all the other things that uh, allow uh, a, a really exciting technology to grow in a way that doesn't hurt people. I'm an enormous champion of uh, crowdsourcing, or wisdom of crowds generally. And I've always believed that you can learn from everybody you talk to. And when you do that, you build relationships. And part of it is a trust sort of thing. But those are people who are there for you when you do have a problem. And so, for example, in a business example, when if you're making a product uh, and you learn that that product has a problem and it's regulated, like in the medical business, you may be forced to have a recall. Well, one of the ways I think you can manage risk is have a good relationship with your customers. And if you discover a problem, call them up and, and go talk to them and say, tell me, what would you do given this problem? You're the user. I'm just the maker. Tell me what you're going to do. And what you can do is literally form a team. You're not gaming the system. You are truly coming up with answers as a result of harnessing the collective intelligence of all these different people. And they're willing to talk to you and give you their best insights because you've earned that trust. Well, first of all, uh, we uh, came very, very close to going under a number of times. I guess that's kind of life in, in, in the entrepreneurial world and in, in the business world when you're starting something new. And we did um, discover that the logic of the product we made was not totally appreciated by a lot of the market that we hoped to serve. Basically, I felt that what we do as a company is we would develop technology, that technology would lead to products, and those products would enable totally new procedures that would reduce risk, trauma, cost, and time. Well, doesn't that sound like, you know, uh, uh, pancakes and hot dogs and mother's apple pie? Well, as it turned out, the surgeons in the marketplace didn't think that was a good idea at all. They told me a number of times, uh, A, that I was immoral and unethical, but in addition to that, they said it's much safer to have a patient fully open, and then when you're going in and you see a problem, you can fix it quickly. And I said, well, you know, isn't that a self-fulfilling prophecy? You've already cut the person open. You know, talk about the cure being worse than the disease. Uh, so. I dealt with that phenomenon for a long time. And it turns out the surgical community is very, very powerful. Uh, they are the macho and, and basically all men uh, and uh, very confident, uh, ego dominates, uh, very good at speaking and at developing power structures, meaning not only were they powerful in their hospital, but they were powerful politically and whatever it is. So they could uh, determine your fate. Our challenge then, because I was frankly confident that this really did make sense. I mean, it's almost, how can you not say it made sense? But we had to prove it. 
The surgeons would come to us and say, show us your 20-year results. And we said, well, wait a second. That's the prisoner's dilemma. How, do we, how are we supposed to get 20-year results if you won't let us do it in the first place? Oh, that's your problem. No, it's not. And, and so we did a lot of things. We, we did a lot of our work overseas where the, the physicians were much more accommodating for this. They were actually interested in, in creating uh, some of these advances that would uh, uh, really benefit the patient in terms of the trauma they'd get, the time, and so forth. So uh, being able to do that and lower the cost as well uh, seemed like a great goal. It actually took uh, almost 10 to 15 years for the, uh, the barriers to be broken. And to do that, we did it literally person by person. It's friends, it's champions, but it's trusted people. It's building relationships and doing that hard over time, being absolutely totally straight with the people, experimenting, learning with them. It was a, really a wonderful experience. Well, first of all, managing the board uh, reminds me of a statement uh, that uh, the head of a museum uh, told me, an art museum, and she said, I love my board. They're fat, dumb, and happy, and, and they are rich. So I, uh, uh, we really didn't have a board at Boston Scientific uh, for our first 12 years of life. What we did have is uh, I had a partner, uh, Peter Nicholas, and he and I uh, would talk to people all the time. Now admittedly one of them was the proprietor of the Greek diner where frankly uh, first generation immigrant we were awed by the immense common sense that this person had but obviously that person wouldn't normally go on a board. Uh, but I think that was the lesson. We would bring in people, they might have been bankers uh, or, or uh, uh, chemical experts or medical experts. Uh, and we had them in all the time. But it wasn't a formal board that would vote on things. They guided us. We shared information with them. Our customers, in a sense, were a board. A form of we used to tell them what we're doing, the problems we were having, uh, their thoughts, and we would do the same for them. Uh, when we did get a board, it was because we went public. And that was the formal requirement for a board. And uh, we uh, brought people on board uh, who were basically believers in the principles that we had uh, espoused. Uh, what I just uh, said in terms of, of the, the, the customer value chain, if you will. And I'd go beyond that. Uh, we believe, I, I believe Boston Scientific is a profitable philanthropy. In other words, what we do benefits society as a whole. And my view is whatever we do, we've got to do things so that it's more than just the triple bottom line that your, its customers and its employees and its shareholders. It is the community uh, as, as a whole. And if you serve them well, focusing on the customers actually using the product, you will create a movement and a culture that will actually reinforce your strength in your growth. I was not uh, one of those people who was well, I take that back. I was early on. I, I, was, I was kind of everything when it was sort of a three-person company uh, where I would go out and get the orders and then come back and build the products and go to the vendors to get the parts and all that sort of stuff. But that basically was, was a separate time for the company. Beyond that, it was a matter of bringing people on board uh, who shared the values, shared the, the mission of what we were trying to do, and uh, creating a culture with them that, in essence, harnesses their collective intelligence. The idea of creating a culture, I think, is vastly underappreciated by a lot of organizations. And this is, this, I'm, I'm sort of cynical about business school in that regard because I think they're focused on minutiae at times where you've got to look at the big picture 
to make sure you've got the right people in the right place. And I, business schools, of course, also say that, but not as much in my mind as they should be. And uh, the, the issue of stepping back, I guess I've been doing for quite a while. Uh, I see the role of a founder being a, a little bit different than a, a, the role of a, a typical CEO, even if sometimes they're the same. My view is, is the founder really has to maintain that connection and that philosophy and should be talking about it all the time. And I've written about it and I talk not just with employee groups, but with customer groups all the time. My view is it's a two-way street. If I talk, I'm explaining why we're doing what we're doing, but also I'm learning the questions that people have and are asking of us. That is valuable to me. One of the questions I love to ask CEOs, if I'm talking to a group of CEOs, is do you have a blog? Now, generally, any corporate lawyer will say, don't do that, whether it's a business, whether it's a school, uh, whether it's a hospital. But in fact, there are businesses, schools, and hospitals uh, that uh, the CEOs do have blogs. Uh, uh, what's his name? Chad, uh, and I'm forgetting his last name for a second, but the CEO of DuPont yeah. has, uh, has, has been a blogger for a long time. And think about what it does. It's really important to understand what you're doing. You're not just singing great praises of the wonderful things you're doing. You may do a little bit of that. But what you're doing is you're talking about your thinking process, the types of issues that have to be addressed by the company, uh, as well as some of the decisions uh, you hope to be able to make. What you're doing is sharing the vision and the decision-making process. Now, admittedly, in a very indirect way, but in fact, that is sort of uh, like giving them shares of stock. Now they own part of the rock. They've heard from, uh, and they hear on a regular basis, from the CEO uh, and frequently from, from others who are talking about that. There are people who misunderstand that and they hire marketing people uh, to do their blogs. No, that's a mistake. That's not, not what I mean by that process, but to me, that's what makes the, the companies that last, you know, the Jim Collins sort of uh, description. It's a matter of having that passion, that sharing, uh, creating that mindset, that culture, where everybody can share and participate at some level. And when you do that, you're really truly harnessing collective intelligence. Well, first of all, it's very humbling. That's perhaps the most, the most important thing. You get surprised. There are a lot of people who really are good in the, the first uh, layers of, of interaction with the organization and, and turn out not to be as effective later on. Uh, as a result, we and in, in, in many other organizations, if you're looking for, for key people, uh, tend to uh, do a bit more of it rather than less of it. Uh, you can't always do that. But there's an interesting thing. Uh, I've always made it a point to understand our competitors as well as ourselves, meaning I like to talk to them. I'm friends with them. We have a common interest in the field, at least. And it's important that we understand how each other thinks. They actually tend to be more concerned about our uh, factual stuff. Uh, you know, the, the resources, the finances, the, the products, and so forth. And that's fine. I'm more interested in how they think. What is driving them? Uh, I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit from Sun Zhu in The Art of War that he wrote 4,000 years ago, which is, is so basic. Uh, that's what he says in terms of fighting the enemy. Understand how they think. In a business, it's how are decisions made. And the frightening thing is that in many cases, large businesses, it's not clear how decisions are made. And it's not clear the role that boards play. You know, think about that in terms of the economic crash. What were those boards thinking? Don't tell me they didn't know that they were practicing an unsustainable behavior. They were waiting for the others to make mistakes, and they thought they'd have enough time to get out. Doesn't work that way. 
Well, I was, uh, I, I was sick when I was a kid. In fact, uh, that's when I said I, I was never going to go near any hospital again if I could avoid it. Well, I end up in the business, sort of, sort of odd. But uh, one of the things I like is, is technology and gadgets. And I, I love uh, seeing the process of solving problems. Uh, and I worked in a hard, hardware store, uh, actually when I was 14. And uh, I, I was able to work my way up to not just being a stock person, but actually talking to customers. What I loved best is I would ask the customer to tell me, what is it you're trying to do? And then working with that customer to try to solve that problem. And it was usually not the way they were thinking of it, going over to the aisle and filing the, finding the product that just does it. It was combining several things that would customize the solution for that problem that they were thinking of. And that was really a lot of fun and rewarding not only because of the you know solving the problem but these great relationships you have with people i think that um, being science and math literate and technology literate is is a fundamental requirement for any liberal arts knowledge that you cannot be an effective citizen today without having that capacity to understand. I'm not saying you have to be a scientist or an engineer. I'm saying being science literate so that you can understand and appreciate. I mean, even understanding the movies and un understanding uh, plays and books requires some science literacy. And, and so uh, I'm fascinated and passionate about uh, making sure kids have that basic understanding, but also that they have the opportunity to go on and pursue it at a greater depth. I'm uh, involved with FIRST. FIRST is actually a robotics competition that was started by uh, Dean Kamen. And the philosophy to do what you just said, how do you motivate kids to want to learn, is based in FIRST, which is let's use the sports model. Let's not focus on the supply side of the equation, where you develop more great programs in schools. Let's focus on the demand side of the equation. Let's make this really fun. You're competing in a sport, but in fact, the sport is designed so that in order to win, you've got to work in teams. Therefore, you've got to collaborate. You have to do more than just one little task. You've got to put things together with your team so that it actually works and it can play with other teams. And you're not only going to learn to collaborate with your teammates, but the game is designed so in order to win, you actually have to collaborate at different times with your opponent. And that, of course, is really the way capitalism was designed. Perhaps those bankers in New York lost the lesson someplace, but in fact, uh, creating that environment really is a culture-changing phenomenon. And I've already told you how important I think culture is, but I, I think if you watch it, the, the answer to the question is watch kids go through that sort of process and environment. You'll see kids who really had no chance. Kids from inner cities uh, where the real problem was discipline in the school. And in fact, whether you're a young girl, definitely, and some young boys, being knowledgeable is a liability in your social life. Uh, being knowledgeable in science and math is really the kiss of death for a girl getting a date. But in the case of first, that's not the case. We're actually, it's, it's about 30% female and, and about 30% uh, minority in, in different uh, areas. And the idea is that creates a whole a network of people with common shared values. And therefore, if you're good at science, then you are high on the pecking order of what people uh, rank very high. And it's, it's not only just being tough that way. Uh, of, of winning a game. You don't 
win by making the opponent lose, which is, which is true in a lot of sports today. That's why, why trash talk was invented. It's intimidation. It's make your opponent do worse and you'll win. My view is ultimately for a sustainable society, you want to constantly raise the ladder, get better and better. And that is the environment that we strive to, uh, uh, strive to achieve in first. And uh, watching those kids, and they will tell you, and uh, we've got 130 colleges and universities that have engineering and technology programs that provide over $12 million worth of scholarships for any kid who has gone through a FIRST program and can meet their and, uh, you know, admission requirements. Why does that happen? Because everything else being equal, they say those kids do better. They've learned to work in a team. They've learned to work on our budget. They've learned to work in a schedule. They've, they've, they've learned how to settle debates. <laughs> they have mentors, of course, that, that do that. So that's the environment that I think we need to provide to get more of the, the kids who are going to allow us to compete against the rest of the countries in the world who are getting better than we are. Well, I suppose it would be inappropriate to say we suck, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we've taken a terrible, terrible downturn, and, and the statistics are quoted all over the place. They might even vary. You, know, you can argue with the numbers, but it's more like we're 20th out of 30 or 20th out of 25 uh, compared to our major competitors. And that doesn't even take into account uh, the Chinas and Indias uh, of, of the world. Statistics point out that the U.S. Is, has been uh, declining in its competitiveness in a lot of different ways. One of them is, is this whole issue of do you have to understand science and math? And we've been graduating a lot of people from high school who literally are uh, illiterate in, in, in science and, and, and math. Uh, in, in the case of math, it's called innumeracy. And that sometimes shows up uh, at high management levels. Uh, you could even argue that it showed up on Wall Street uh, this past year or two. But uh, in order to get around that, we need to make it desirable on the part of the kids. Uh, in, in hiring uh, the young today, it's very interesting you can see the people who are in the U.S. but foreign-born. They want to learn. They want to work. Whereas with a lot of our born-in-the-U.S. Uh, types, they are looking for the perfect life being a rock star or bouncing a ball. And uh, that's not a sustainable model. It's probably not one lesson, lots of lessons, but I think it's, it's being a better listener, um, and that's, that's difficult. If you are in a leadership position in, in a corporation, uh, an awful lot of people patronize you. Sorry, it's the disease. And if that happens too much, you almost think that's real life. Uh, and you see that happening to a lot of people who were great, and then over time, life became a little bit easier. They focused down and down. That happened to me. And uh, I felt it was more important to get out and, and make those connections again. And, and that's where the real value uh, came. It's fascinating for me to, to, to watch others do this. And we are going through a, such a fundamental culture change in our society. This is around the world. And, and whether it, you know, the world is flat or uh, what's Dan Pink's uh, uh, recent Whole New Mind, uh, uh, lots of books. But I think they accurately describe this phenomenon that the average individual today has the power of yesterday's CEOs. They can get information that most people can't get. And the irony is the younger ones are better at getting it than the older ones. <laughs> so uh, that's an interesting almost reversal in trend. 
But with it, it's brought a sort of an overconfidence on the part of a lot of those people uh, that they have rights and, and uh, not the responsibilities uh, to lots of things uh, and therefore don't have that work ethic or even the social ethic that's so necessary for our survival. I've given a, a number of talks along the lines of uh, big company innovation and other oxymorons. And uh, I'm doing that because everybody's thinking that, so I might as well state it up front. How does a big company do that? Well, there, there are lots of ways. And, and John Chambers has you know, been quite outspoken about that at, at Cisco. And when you're in those roles, you, you look at others to see what they are doing. And one of the things that I find is uh, keeping small product, small projects rather small, and sometimes even keeping big projects small as long as you can do it, and even separating the function of the small operation that is really trying to figure out what the right question is, even though you've already made a decision, you never stop asking that question because that's where the greatest innovation does come from. It's asking the question upside down. And big companies have a lot of advantages. They have market power, they have reach, they have credibility. Uh, they tend to be stifled by bureaucracy and Washington is, is giving us the wonderful opportunity to try to figure out new ways to beat even more bureaucracy. Uh, and sometimes that bureaucracy comes from the organization itself uh, that they really don't need. So it's a very, very difficult uh, challenge. But uh, the classic one is divide yourself not into silos, but into interconnected, uh, interconnected rather networks. Uh, I would argue that network science is going to be the most important field of the future. We're only scratching the surface on what's going to happen as we learn how to connect with people all over the world. And of course, not only how to connect people, but also treat cancer, because cancer is a network science problem. And we will learn, in fact, that is happening uh, at a number of institutions right now where there are potential breakthroughs based on that phenomenon. So I think we're going to learn a great deal, and it's going to be uh, you know, really exciting in terms of people who want to address needs of society generally and make money at it at the same time. Mm -hmm.